just a couple of minutes. Wow. And we've Nancy, heard some good things about you, Miss Scrubs. You better be tight tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so you're the new principal? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. Ah, and, so, and were you in another school before before now? Well, actually, uh, I have been at Snowden for 27 years, and I left for a year to be the principal at uh, Delano, uh -huh. and the superintendent asked me to come back after the formal principal retired. Yeah. yeah. yeah we, we miss Jamie, but I think you'll be wonderful to work with, too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yes, I like I repeat, you come with high marks, Miss Scruggs. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Big shoes. Oh great. yes, ma'am. We're def we're definitely up for the challenge. Yeah, oh, you do great. Shirley Key, yes, hello, Shirley. Yes. So, Miss Scruggs, um, tell us when we have most of the people that you hello, think are joining us, so that we know when to start. Okay. We'll give it another, what, five minutes, do you think? Could start about 5.20, and then we can still let people in, for sure. Okay, okay, that'd be wonderful. And that'll keep our program on so that Ryan... Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, Principal Scruggs, we are recording the meeting. Just wanted to let you know in case you want to be able to see it later or for school records or whatever. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So we're just going to give everybody just a few more minutes and then we'll get started. Oh, okay. I just read a note in the chat from Ryan that you've got a hard cut off at six. So we okay. will get started. Then. We'll get started. Yep. Okay. Looks, looks like we've got a few that are still joining us here. Good. All right. Hi, Susan. Okay, it's nice well, to meet you. Go ahead and at least have uh, introductions to start out with. Um, and uh, I, if, if you will allow me, I'm going to turn it over to you since the first segment of our meeting is concerning Snowden. So welcome, everybody. And if you aren't muted, if you mute yourself just now for a little while, and then we'll un unmute you if you want to speak during the time. That way we won't have noise cut in. Thank you so much. Well, we are just thrilled that this contest has kept going. Um, Carl and I, my husband, for those who don't know, and I have been to a couple of international Rotary conventions. And at one of them, we happened on a table uh, and there was an explanation of this contest which was being done, we discovered, by the entire state of Georgia in their high schools. And uh, 46,000 entrants or something like that, you know. But, you know, in, in our own way, in my way, I thought, you know, we could do that here. We don't have to start out with 46,000 entrants, but maybe because Jamie Stahl Smith was in a principal uh, at Snowden and in our um, Rotary Club, we could start there. She said, sure, let's talk with the teachers because the last thing we wanna do is burden the teachers with additional work. But when we went and met together, this was four years ago, they said, we welcome this because we need young people to be writing in the English language arts program. And our request was that they, everybody, be asked to participate, not just clue kids or whatever, but that everybody be given the opportunity to do this. Uh, and they said yes, and that was MLK 50 year. And so they wrote on Martin Luther King that year. This year, the essay was put out and it had to be done virtually, which complicated everything, but my commendations deep commendations to the teachers who are here with us. And since some of you have joined us, uh, I will say Ms. Scruggs, the principal, uh, thank you so much for supporting this. Susan McClanahan came in as, as the new coordinator of everything. And then we had uh, Ms. Milton 
and Mr. E Mr. Eccles. Um, there were other teachers as well, but um, people have changed responsibilities too. So this year, the topic was perseverance. And there were two quotes that they were given. And one was, if you, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And that was a quote from Dr. King. And the second is most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. And that was Dale Carnegie. And so they could choose we have any, uh... those two and write about perseverance related to that. They didn't have to, however, use those quotes. Do we have uh, grocery bags? Yeah. I'm hanging in the... Somebody needs to mute. And, uh, I'm hearing talk about grocery bags in the back. Um, so what we tried to do is uh, judge on originality, judge on at least one personal experience, organization, focus on topic, relevance of ideas, and the least important thing, but essential, but not that important in terms of the essence of perseverance, and that was spelling, grammar, and punctuation. So I, I was delighted to see that uh, we got a lot of support from students, not as many as by any means as we have before, but enough to really make it a good viable contest. And I wanna thank the essay judges this year. And that's Will and Adele, Valerie, Carl, Chet, Dustin, Maury, Ellen, and I want to also thank Denise for coordinating so many things around this. Ellen for talking me through everything. Charlotte for coordinating all the checks and figuring out how all the pieces go together in a, in a wonderfully inimitable fashion. And Les for getting the checks out. So if I've missed everybody, anybody, just know that thanks. We just think you're the world. The students this year wrote about hardship and they wrote about some cases of COVID in their families, um, in some cases, multiple cases. They wrote about family members passing away. They wrote about family members at risk. They wrote about unemployment. They wrote how difficult it was to be without seeing their friends. One mentioned that uh, they were glad that they turned a teenager, but it was a tough to turn a teenager in these words. Uh, they wrote about virtual learning and it, how it helped, but how it was difficult too, because one student said, you know, I love science, but there was no science lab. Uh, they wrote about um, annoying family members when they were trying to work and they had to deal with little brothers and sisters and sharing computers. Um, they wrote about a new awareness of world events, racism and world hunger and different killings that have happened to tragedies, the horrible things that have happened this year. So how with all this going on in their lives, did they get by? They got by with their positive attitudes. They got by with the help of the power of technology. One got by because he said, I, I'm like a phoenix, phoenix that got knocked out multiple times, but rose up from the ashes. They got by with incredible determination. And one wrote again that they got by with the power of music and lyrics in their lives. So first I wanna thank parents for raising kids that are really willing to take a risk and enter a contest like this and see the importance of the writing um, of the teachers, of the principal. Uh, and I want to particularly thank the students who are just wonderful and I wanna honor them right now. Um, so in sixth grade, the number third place winner is Patience Lester. I don't know if Patience is on, but if you want to put in your reactions down at the bottom and give her a hands up clapping or a love thing like I'm doing, I'm just, you know, just applaud, applaud, applaud. We have to use this technology somehow. 
Number two, the sixth grade winner was Nolan Harris. And Nolan, yes, there we go. I'm going to give another reaction. Yay. And number one, and I think I saw him on, and that is Jason Vu. Jason, are you, can we, can yes, we see your here. face? Um, I, I don't. I know I said hi earlier, but congratulations to the three of you for being sixth graders and stepping forward in this way. Uh, the eighth graders and the winners is on. are Grace Edgiston, and she is number th the third place winner. The second place winner is Yancey McLaren. I'm trying to flip in my screen and see who's on and who's not. But if you're not, just know that we are supporting and will those of you who know these people support them and tell them we think they're wonderful. And number one, the eighth grade winner, Everett Carter. So these students have won a certificate which has been delivered to the school and they've also won cash prizes. First place was $75, second place 50, and third place $25. And I'm just, I'm so excited that we've continued to do this contest. And I really appreciate all the help from the club and the support. So thank you very, very much. And now I will pass this on to Dr. Fred Johnson, a longtime friend and fellow member and You're muted, Fred. Do you know how to unmute? Fred, can you unmute yourself? I just He's don't move as fast as I used gotcha. to. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Okay. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. Uh, I miss seeing all of you. First, I'd like to congratulate the students for their achievements under adverse circumstances. Uh, I encourage you to continue because writing is so important. The way we convince the world happens to be through words. So we congratulate you, we encourage you, keep up the good work and congratulations to the new principal. It is my task to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to shout out to my friend Herb Hilliard. Uh, this meeting would not be uh, as it is were it not for Herb. So thanks to Herb. The gentleman, uh, the Civil Rights Museum is indeed an icon in Memphis, uh, a key icon. And yesterday I heard a gentleman speak by the name of Anthony Ray Hinton. Mm. You need to know about him if you don't. Mm. He wrote a book, The Sun Does Shine. Uh, I'm convinced now that the Civil Rights Museum is a place where healing can take place and where sincere conversation can take place as well. We are honored to have with us as our speaker this evening, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Ryan M. Jones. He's a uh, museum educator and the lead tour guide at the Civil Rights Museum. He's a native Memphian with a special background in the civil rights movement during the 60s. Uh, he has great knowledge about the, uh, and is doing research about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And he is working on a PhD at the University of Memphis in history. And his dissertation is so moving. It deals with the cold cases during the civil rights movement in Mississippi and Arkansas. That's really a broad subject for a dissertation. Mr. Jones, we're honored to have you and the floor is all yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Everett, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Awesome and Ms. Hoyle for uh, inviting me to do this on behalf of the National Civil Rights Museum 
And also, again, thanks, uh, Mr. Hillier, who's a continuing supporter of, of what we do every day at the museum. And I would also like to congratulate all of the students on uh, their achievements during this historical time uh, in history to continue to strive for, for greatness. Um, I remember when I was 11 and, and wrote my first essay on one of my passions, which was history. And I wrote on, on Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And I, I heard Robert Kennedy give a speech the night that Dr. King was assassinated in our city. And it, at 11, 12 years old, it was then that I realized that, you know, there were so many people who gave the ultimate sacrifice for freedom, justice, and equality. And I felt that it would be my passion and, and something of, to be productive and to follow in their footsteps and to, uh, to make sure that their voices were heard. So kudos to all of you students. Um, it, it's, uh, it's something that you can't ever have taken away from you. So again, um, what I wanted to do was that uh, if you all had not uh, have not visited the National Civil Rights Museum, we have reopened. Uh, we are open uh, every day except for Tuesday and Wednesday. Right now, during this post-COVID time, um, we're open from nine to five on those days. So if you have not toured the museum, I, I encourage every citizen, every human being to go through those doors of the museum. But today I'm just gonna give you a brief sneak preview of what you would see inside of the museum and why and how the National Civil Rights Museum came today. So if I could share my screen really quick, let's see, and I'll start from there. So what I'll show briefly at the beginning is um, a few clips of how the National Civil Rights Museum became. Of course, we were the original Lorraine Motel and what happened immediately after the Lorraine Motel foreclosed in 1983. Of course, we'll, we will discuss that final moment. And so the assassination happens and 14 years later, the Lorraine. Ryan, do you know that we can't hear 
this very well. At least I can't. I don't know if other people can. Uh, let me see if I can. Is that a little better? It's no. the audio for your presentation that's not coming through. We can hear you fine. It's, it's the presentation we can't hear. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. The pictures are wonderful. The, the, or just give us commentary over the top of it. Yeah. If needed. Sure, I can do that. Okay. Um, hmm. Come can you read what's on the bottom? I see what's on the bottom. Sure. So I listen to so what... We can hear it now. Okay, great from Japan, from China, from Germany, from France, from England, wherever they might be from, they would want to visit that spot. The museum eventually expanded to include the boarding house next to the Young and Morrill building, where investigators agree that the bullet that killed Dr. King was fired. We used the site of a tragedy to tell the story of a deep movement, uh, the courage and the sacrifice and the determination. Today, the museum continues to serve as a hub for activities supporting human rights, which includes presenting annual Freedom Awards to national and global leaders. The creation of the National Civil Rights Museum tells the story not only of Dr. King's life and work, but that of countless others, and gives visitors a deeper understanding of America's rich history. So I'm happy to announce that the museum has been open for approximately 30 years this year. We will celebrate our 30th anniversary um, in September of this year, 2021. Going on to that, in 2014, the museum renovated. We went on, underwent a $27 million renovation campaign. And so we updated our exhibitions um, to a much more digital interaction and we updated the interpretation into the scholarship within our museum as well. And so on a normal day, I'm just gonna, this is footage of what it is like every day at the museum. I can talk over that as well. You'll probably be able to hear some, some sound with it. But of course, as the video stated, this was the Little Rain Motel, it was built in 1945. It accommodated African-Americans living in the Jim Crow South through the 1940s, all the way till about 1968. Dr. King was a regular guest here. He had stayed three times prior to his assassination. Of course, that's his room that he checked into on Wednesday, April 3rd, 1968. And we'll go more into that as we go through the museum itself. The Lorraine was also featured in what we call the Green Book, which was a handbook that was uh, in African-American homes. As you would travel throughout the Deep South, you would have businesses, restaurants, bathrooms, lodging like the Lorraine, uh, where they knew that it was friendly to stay in. This is our sculpture movement to overcome, built by Mr. Michael Pavlovsky in 1989. And it is a map of the United States of America. You can see the southern tip of Florida down there. And it is to show that we as a nation have come so far from the age of slavery, slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation. However, still in April 2021, we have so much more to accomplish. Many scholars suggest that the civil rights movement begins in 1954. We rewind that going back to when the first enslaved Africans arrived on the coast of Jamestown, Virginia in the year 1619 in what was known as the transatlantic slave trade in the Middle Passage. Of course, the practice of American slavery in the United States makes this country one of the wealthiest er areas in the entire world, trading free slave labor for resources in return for things such as tobacco and cotton. Slavery remains the law of the land until the American Civil War uh, breaks out in April 1861 and concludes in April of 19, 1865 with the passages of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Throughout the early of 20th century, the 
the United States Supreme Court ruled that segregation, separate but equal, was the law of the land. So men like Thurgood Marshall decided that we're going to show that separate but equal is unequal. The best way to do that was in the school system. So that's a recreation of the United States Supreme Court, where on May 17, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education ruled that schools in this country were to be integrated at once, which really did not happen until the mid 1970s. One of the more highlights of our tour of course, uh, on December 1st, 1955, 42-year-old seamstress Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery, Alabama bus. This is, of course, not the actual bus that she boarded on that day. That bus is in Dearborn, Michigan at the Ford's Museum. But this bus was pulled from the 1955 fleet. Because of Mrs. Parks' arrest and the 381-day bus boycott led by then a 26-year-old Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it becomes the first major accomplishment and achievement of the modern civil rights movement. forwarding about five or six years. In 1960, African-American college students would attend historically black colleges and universities, such as Tennessee State and Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And they would sit in at a lunch counter at a store known as Woolworths or Cresses, knowing ahead of time that they would not be served because of the color of their skin. These were known as sit-ins, where you would sit in knowing that you would not be served and you would remain nonviolent. A group of opposers who did not want you there would come in and you would be attacked. After you were attacked, you would likely be arrested. So another wave of students would come in and take their places. And this brought awareness to the issue of racial discrimination. These were simply 18, 19 year old children who simply wanted to be served under the 14th Amendment. And many of our most seasoned civil rights pioneers, such as the late Congressman John Lewis, uh, Ms. Diane Nash, and Julian Bond, were all began in the sit in movement of 1960 and 1961. The Freedom Rides of 1961, a group of interracial civil rights activists decided that they wanted to desegregate interstate bus travel. On May the 4th, 13 of them leave the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and they're trying to drive throughout the South. They face very little resistance in the Upper South, but on Mother's Day, 1961, uh, two buses are attacked by members of the Ku Klux Klan in Anniston and Birmingham, Alabama. This is a recreation of that depiction on that Sunday afternoon in, in, in Birmingham. Birmingham was the most segregated city in America. It was nicknamed Bombing Cam. It was the home of Governor George Wallace, who vowed segregation forever in the city and the state. Dr. King arrived in Birmingham because he knew that if they could desegregate the city of Birmingham, he could desegregate the entire country. On Good Friday of 1963, Dr. King is arrested. And while he's incarcerated, he's receiving a lot of criticism from clergymen who are asking for him to have a king off period. And he responds with what we know is a letter from a Birmingham jail stating that 100 years since President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation that African Americans are still not treated as first class citizens. It was also here in Birmingham where children seven years old to 17 years old were attacked by Bull Connor's water hoses and German shepherds, prompting President Kennedy to sign and pass a civil rights bill the following year. Because of the major success in Birmingham, civil rights leaders gathered at the nation's capital on Wednesday, August 28, 1963, at what we know as the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The National Civil Rights Museum has compiled the entire itinerary as it happened before and after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s most iconic moment to date where he delivered his I Have a Dream speech to 250,000 Americans at the Lincoln Memorial. Came 
although segregation was found illegal at the passage of the Civil Rights Bill, African Americans in the Deep South were still denied the right to vote in places like rural Mississippi and rural Alabama, such as the state, the city of Selma. On Sunday, March the 7th, 1965, about 300 marchers gathered on US Highway 80 at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, led by John Lewis and Hosea Williams. They were met by a sea of Alabama state troopers where they were attacked for trying to raise consciousness to have the right to vote which was in the American Constitution in the 15th and 19th Amendment. Because of the events in Selma, Alabama, President Johnson does sign the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Black Power, Black Pride is a crossroads in the civil rights movement where many civil rights leaders began to decide to take a much more militant approach towards civil and human rights. This was also a period where celebrities and athletes and entertainers began using their platform to speak out against racial injustice across the United States. So what you see here is our join the movement table where there are several different ideas and the, the, theologies and ideologies that you can too have your voices heard within the movement. Here in Memphis, Tennessee, if you were an African-American sanitation worker, you made right about a dollar an hour. You could qualify for government assistance after working 90 hours a week. This is what originally caught, caught Martin Luther King Jr.'s attention and what brought him to the city. Sanitation workers began walking downtown on Bill and Main Street, carrying that picket sign that said the words of, I am a man showcasing to the rest of the world that even after the Declaration of Independence, the 14th Amendment, and the newly passed civil rights bills, that they were not treated as men in the United States of America. So Dr. King comes to Memphis on their behalf in the spring of 1968. And of course, Dr. King stayed in room 306, which is what we're looking at now. This is the original room, and it, it's the only room that is left of the original Lorraine Motel. The bed that you see that's partially unmade right there was Dr. King's bed. And in just a brief moment, I will go into the very last moments and, and really the last 24 hours of his life and what, what was really going on in Memphis at that time. So if you do come to the museum, you will have the opportunity to view this this, this sacred place, which is what we, how we define it. Um, and it humanizes this man who was only 39 years old, who again gave the ultimate sacrifice for freedom, justice, and equality. As I stated just a little while before, it, it was sanitation workers who um, were not making, were, were not making decent working wages. As a matter of fact, two sanitation workers were accidentally killed and crushed to death in the back of a garbage truck while on their route because they were, they were not able to go into the front of the garbage truck themselves. So they decide to go on strike and Dr. King comes to the city of Memphis on their behalf. When Dr. King returns to Memphis on Wednesday, April the 3rd, he has flu-like symptoms. He's suffering from laryngitis and he's just mentally, physically worn out. And he was scheduled to speak at a, a nearby rally at the Mason Temple, which was about five minutes from the Lorraine Motel downtown. And he doesn't think there's gonna be a large turnout because in Memphis, there is tornado warnings all in the Shelby County, area, Shelby County area. So instead he sends the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young and a young Jesse Jackson in his place. Once they arrive into the temple, they see that over 2000 people have gathered. So they immediately call Dr. King from the Lorraine and they usher him over to the Mason Temple. And that night he says something that he hadn't said in any of his other profound speeches in the last 12 years of his life. And so I'm going to let you hear a very brief portion of what Dr. King said on that final night of April the 3rd, 1968. We've got to give ourselves to this struggle 
until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in ministry. I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. I left Atlanta this morning and then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Of course, that was at 1045, April the 3rd, Wednesday. The following day, I had the opportunity to interview the Reverend Andrew Young last year in Atlanta for a documentary. And we spoke about that night and that morning. And he said to me that it was as if he had preached the fear of death out of his soul. All of the stress, the death threats. He was arrested 32 times from... January 1956 to December 1967. Um, and, it, and it made him remind himself that this was just a 39-year-old minister who wanted to serve God, uh, who wanted to be a good husband to his, his wife, who's the architect of his legacy. Today is also her 94th birthday, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and his four young children uh, who were living in Atlanta at the time. But he, they had never seen him in the most joyous and jubilant mood in months after, since after he gave that speech. And so on that afternoon at the Lorraine Motel, Dr. King never leaves uh, the Lorraine's uh, campus. And he has, he calls his parents from the Lorraine Motel downstairs in room 202. And then he's scheduled to go and eat dinner at a local Memphis minister's home. So he goes inside and he gets dressed and he steps outside on the parking, on the court, on the balcony, and he's speaking to people in the courtyard. And he and the Reverend Jesse Jackson have, a, have an embrace where they, he's, Dr. King scolds him jokingly for not having a tie on for dinner. Reverend Jackson responds with, Dr. Prerequisite for dinner is an appetite and I have that. He then spots a Memphis musician named Ben Branch, who was a saxophonist. And he calls down and he says, Ben, I have a request for dinner tonight. I want you to play Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And I want you to play it real pretty. And then his chauffeur, Mr. Solomon Jones, calls up and says, Doc, you should go and grab your jacket. And Dr. King stands up from the balcony and he looks as if he's looking across the street. And he says, do you really think I'll need my coat? And at that exact moment, a loud noise rings out from 205 feet across the street. Dr. King was taken from, from the balcony to St. Joseph's Hospital, which is now part of where St. Jude Children's Hospital is, where he was pronounced dead at 7.05 p.m. Of all of the five political assassinations from 1963, beginning with Medgar Evers, President John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Dr. King, and of course, two months later, Robert F. Kennedy. Dr. King's assassination response, the aftermath was complete civil unrest and public uprisings. 
because Americans of all races and ethnicities could not fathom who would want to take the life of a man who fought for freedom, justice, and equality the nonviolent way. He was the most hated man when he was assassinated and yet is one of the most glorified and celebrated today, yet he loved so much, but yet he was killed so violently. And so the National Civil Rights Museum, it's important for us to remember these stories because in, when we look at it 51 years ago, is not that long ago. Right? And with the events that are going on today in our country today, it's really important for us to still reconcile and remind ourselves of the advancement that we still can make room for for all of our citizens in this country. So we like to make sure that here at the museum, not only are you gonna learn about the past, but that this is also an opportunity for our next generation to continue and pass the baton so that we can live in a more imperfect community. And so again, on behalf of the museum, Mrs. Coyle, Mrs. Awesome, uh, thank you uh, for having me here. I, I look forward to hopefully uh, being able to come back and participate in more of the events of the Midtown Memphis Rotary Club. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you, um, Mr. Jones. And um, Char, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, can we give Mr. Jones um, lead claps or 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 something for an outstanding and extraordinarily enlightening presentation. Um, your presentation left us tonight with not only basic enlightenment, but it left us with the hope and the sunshine that reminds us that there is still a struggle. And if you look around, you can't see everyone on our screen, but if you look around, our screen, you will find that one of the tenets of the Midtown Memphis Rotary is diversity. Diversity in age, diversity, brown, black, yellow, everything, it, it, you know, any color you want, um, cultures. And that is one of the reasons that our Rotary Club at this point is so successful is because even though we're all different, we're all the same. We all believe in service. And we appreciate you coming tonight, giving your service, because I know we've been working on this for, for months, <laughs> for months. Thank Dr. Fred immensely. Thank you, Ryan, for coming. Um, everyone connected with the museum. And one thing I would like to suggest is once all of this pandemic is over, maybe we can make, maybe we can have a tour of the museum. And also, Ryan, we invite you to be a member of the Midtown Memphis Rotary Club. We're not only diverse, we're cool, and we welcome brains because we are brain trust. We want we think that our Rotary Club can make a difference not only in Memphis because Rotary is international. We think that we can make a difference internationally by being a model for what diversity in service really is. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you again for having me. And I again uh, hope that uh, everyone who has not visited the museum, hopefully in the future, we can go on a tour together. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for joining us. Let's give them up. Rotary, thank you. Are, you, are you able to stay for any questions or? Uh, I think there's some in the chat room. Yeah, we've, we've got one uh, so far and someone wants to know um, how many visitors does the Civil Rights Museum have in a year? It's approximately between 280,000 to about 203, we could, on a good, on a good year, 300,000, but we stay around the 280,000 annually. Um, on your website, is there a place that shows all the different people that you've given awards to? We do okay. on our Freedom Award. If you go to civilrightsmuseum.org, uh, going back to the past 30 years, we have all of our uh, dignitaries and heads of states uh, people that we have awarded the Freedom Award recipient honor. Ryan, I know that you, that I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, that's a great question, Denise. Can you just enumerate a few of those people that have received sure. awards? Uh, it's, it's 
Merle Evers, uh, President Joe Biden, uh, Danny Glover, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier. Um, Nelson gosh, Mandela. There's, there's, there's so many people. Um, President have, Clinton. Beg your pardon, Bill, say what now? President Clinton. President Clinton was there, Vice President Al Gore. Um, Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama. Gorbachev. Correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, Rosa Parks in 1992. So many right. have come through and have been given that prestigious award. So we'll find that list on your, your website. Uh, General yes, Harvey, you have a question? I did, Mr. Jones, thank you. It was a great presentation. I took some people uh, to the museum two or three weekends ago and we were not able to get in. And I didn't realize before we went that you really need a reservation, uh, particularly on the weekends. So just as a heads up to, anybody that might want to visit uh, on the weekends, uh, you really need to make uh, those arrangements ahead of time. Good point. It, it, it's a busier time. And, and we do that because of, uh, we want to make sure that everyone that it's inside the museum, we're not over capacities with still with the uh, ongoing pandemic. And what about group arrangements? You, you do group tours. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I, we have a group sales department. Uh, I, I normally rarely do tours anymore unless it's uh, a special request. Uh, but we do have a group sales department where you would call them and they would schedule your group to come in. Uh, I think the more that you have in your group, there's some sort of discount, I believe. But um, it, it, it works in that way. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I know that Ryan, you've got a meeting very, very soon and have to leave us. Uh, any last questions, anybody? Uh, not a question, but Ryan, before you leave, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Al Harvey. And he has a great project initiative that's about to go on that you might be interested in. It takes us back to diversity and all working together um, in a unique fashion. Al? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to give that some publicity tonight. It's our rotary project called uh, Socks for Vets. And what we're doing is collecting uh, socks, pairs of socks to take to the veterans at the uh, VA Memphis Hospital. Uh, it is a project which uh, some rotary clubs around the country have put on. We have an advantage in that uh, the Memphis VA Hospital is right in our area uh, for Midtown Memphis Rotary. So it's a great project for us. Uh, our goal is to collect 500 pairs of socks, um, uh, which means that we need it uh, to be a, a real effort on everybody's part. Um, we're collecting them at uh, Mike Simpson's house, which is at 1355 Peabody. I think, Mike, we have somewhere close to about 200 pairs so far. And it's very easy to uh, go to Target or Walmart or Walgreens or whatever and pick up a number of pairs of socks and take them to Mike Simpson's porch. And you can park right there in the front and leave them right at uh, uh, Mike's uh, place. Uh, both Ben Jabour and Kendall White are also working this project. And so we just encourage everybody in the club to uh, write yourself a note, go to one of these uh, uh, places to buy socks and uh, pick up uh, four or five packs and take them to Mike's house. And we will present them about uh, sometime around the middle of May. So we need everybody to react uh, as soon as possible, if at all possible. So thanks very much and hope you can participate. Thank, Thank you. you, Ryan. And we'll send you the we'll send you the address so you can drop some socks off. And we would appreciate you if you just pass it on because if you think about our veterans, that is a part of human rights. And sometimes we forget because we're so immersed in our own world just how important it is to think of others. And you have shown us and brought us back to that point tonight. We uh, 
completing our session, Ryan, we had a session um, on human rights. <clears throat> we had Facing History and Ourselves last meeting, and now with Civil Rights Museum, this meeting, you have taken us to another level. We had Jimmy Jalinek, and thank you, Jimmy, if you're on here, and Dr. Fred, who are the stalwarts really of the city. We're uh, so pleased to have both of them as part of us because they add something that I don't think any two gentlemen can add to an organization. They're, they're as different as they are alike. And you think about the friendship that they've had, I don't even know how many years, and that is indeed a light torch in civil rights and being part of humanity and helping us to remember that there, there is a better way. And we look to not only Dr. Fred, but Jimmy for being mentors for us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Ryan. Uh, I will be contacting you. I will be contacting you in the next few weeks <laughs> okay. to check your schedule and to see uh, if we can entice you to lend us your brain. Certainly, I'll, I'll be looking forward to it. You all have Thank a you. wonderful night. Thank you, Thank Ryan. You, Ryan. If everybody will still stay on, we have a, a little bit more in the way of business. Uh, one, Ellen, are you on um, available to chat about nominations? She's not unmuted. I think she's gone. Um, she's, it looks like she's still on, but yeah. not unmuted. And, um, she she, so she used, uh, Denise, sometimes she can't, some, sometimes she can't talk from her, from her phone. Okay. Sometimes she has a bad connection. Right. One, one, one item that, that we want to cover um, is that a lot of us are not getting our rotary newsletters or not getting our mail regularly. And if you've had any changes in your street address, your email address or a phone, um, please let, um, Ellen and Les know they were, their names were on the newsletter so that we can update our database because we want to make sure that, that you're not in the dark about what's going on. And then secondly, um, that um, we are starting to get organized for elections and um, volunteers for various committees and uh, for participation on the board. And so if you have an interest or you think that someone would be good uh, in terms of the, a leadership role, please don't hesitate to write um, Ellen uh, Torno about that um, so that um, she has that information that you're interested or that you have a nominee. Anything Allison. else, Char? Oh, I'm sorry. Could, go on. No, that's it. I'm asking just you, want, do, okay. do you want to add just, to that? Okay, I just want to introduce Allison, who um, is... We're, we're fortunate that you joined us again tonight, Allison. And can you introduce yourself to some of the members who weren't here last week? Oh, um, last two weeks. Oh yeah, sure. My name's Allison Harris. Um, I am a, an environmental consultant, professional geologist at InSafe in Memphis. Um, I've actually been here for 29 years. I've worked here. Um, and I've heard about the Rotary for quite a long time. My brother is president of the Hendersonville Rotary. And so I've heard all about your good works for quite a long time. So I was very interested in joining. Thank you, Allison. And we're, and we're quite pleased that you've made an application to the Midtown Memphis Rotary. Like I always say, it's the cool, it's the cool group because we're the diverse group. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And Thank you fun. so much. <laughs> yeah, and we have fun. Yeah, that's the main thing. And we have uh, a diverse group of people and that, that means a lot. Hi, um, George. Yes. Oh, there's. Uh, is that hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I've been texting in a chat box. You, oh, you have no, sorry. Okay. No, no. I just wondered if any of my my messages. Kind of, uh, yeah. No. Quickly. Sorry. I have sound and and. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to let everyone know I have actually contacted the. Uh, quite a lot of the members with my Hotmail address. And I know that it's such an old email address that it tends to land into the spam box or the junk box. So I'm just asking you, just double check that you have not received an email from me. And 
no reply would not be an offense. <laughs> I just want to make sure that at least you, you get the chance to read it. And um, we are making very good progress in, in getting people engaged. So that's, that's really, really good actually. Um, but uh, we are still looking for a president elect. Um, so the call is out there. If any of you feel like it's something you would like to do uh, or talk about, uh, please just raise your hand and uh, let's let's chat. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, one other thing that uh, Dr. Kendall White mentioned, I forgot to mention when Al was speaking, there are also socks on the Amazon website. I think there are 10 socks, 10 pairs of socks for $19. So that's that's another option if you aren't out and about because you actually could send it straight to Mike's house. But that's another option I forgot from my notes. Um, and Dr. Fred mentioned the book. I put it in the, in the chat box that is very amazing. I was on the call too yesterday, Dr. Fred, and I put it in the, in the uh, chat box. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed in this book. The sun does shine and it is, it is heartbreaking, but at the same time it's sunshine. So it might be something that we could even review at another time and maybe even um, as part of our meeting, we could maybe possibly have Mr. Hinton, maybe not him personally, but maybe a uh, Zoom or a video or something on him because it hits right to the heart of the Midtown Memphis Road. So if you get a chance, pick it up. I put it in the chat box. Um, the sun does shine and it's by, uh, what's his first name, Dr. Fred? It's Hinton. Anthony Ray Hinton. Okay, Anthony Ray Hentis. So, and this book comes with the recommendation of not only Dr. Fred, but also our friend Jimmy Jalinak, <laughs> our human right, our human rights leaders. So, if you get a chance, uh, view it, and maybe we can discuss it as a club at some point. Sounds good. I think um, Pan, did you have a question? I did, it's not a question, but I don't, I'm not sure that all the members were on when we were honoring the students and parents and teachers. And I just wanted to mention again, how thrilled we are and how much we appreciate your entering the contest, um, how much we appreciate the support from Snowden that we get for, because we've done several other projects there too. Uh, and I was over there today and Snowden has is doing, it looks like a lot of native plant, uh, uh, plantings around and really sprucing up the, the uh, campus at Snowden. So congratulations there. But th thank you students so much for caring, for persevering, for your determination, uh, for your perseverance most of all. Thanks. Uh, BJ? BJ? She's on, but she's she's not. Oh, there she is. Muted. She's coming okay. in. BJ, a few words from you. Maybe we'll give her a chance to connect. Oh, any any other announcements while we're waiting for BJ? Uh, she has this no is, on the computer. Uh, yeah. This is this is a pat on the back to Midtown Memphis Rotary. We had a district meeting this past uh, Saturday. And the Midtown Memphis Rotary got a huge shout out for all of our uh, themed speakers and specifically for our service projects uh, throughout this pandemic year. And there is an offer, and I haven't spoken to Al about it, with, you know, with, and, and Ben and Ken Dale, but they're offering possibly to make our uh, socks for vets go district-wide so that we can get lots of socks. Because we started with 100, then we moved up to 
200, then 500. But now maybe we can get a thousand if we get district. You tell you want to put something in the chat box on that. So, so thank you because we couldn't do it without a team because the Midtown Memphis Rotary is other than it's more than a club, it's a family. Great. Uh, BJ, I think it's on now. Yes, thank you so very much. And uh, want to uh, echo what Charlotte, uh, President Charlotte has just said. And I made sure that in the reporting for the district board meeting to reflect the signature projects that you're doing. And uh, I want you to know that I also highlighted uh, your club in the Rotary Leadership Institute, which was done with the all five different districts here recently. And uh, with you all taking that calendar and assigning 22 different people as leaders, I was doing the session on leaders in action. And to take 22 different people out of your club as leaders to head a project, oh. that's just phenomenal. And so had uh, as a suggestion as how to engage people with what it is that they enjoy doing. And you're multiplying, you're not adding, you're multiplying leaders, leading leaders. And uh, so it's in writing, it's in the history of the recording of the minutes for the board meeting. And uh, apparently District Governor Carmen Oguz picked up on it and uh, highlighted you all at the district meeting and kudos because you all are doing it in, you're in alignment with Rotary International's mission and way of doing things and you have the heart of Rotarians and I appreciate so very much and I feel honored to be your assistant governor. So thank you all so much and uh, kudos to the uh, parents and the teachers and the students on today as well. Great programming. Thanks, BJ. Charlotte, Thank you, BJ. you want to close well, the meeting? Pardon? I said, would you like to close the meeting? Well, I'd just like to close the meeting if we can, if we can give ourselves some pats on the back. <laughs> <laughs> because we couldn't do this. This is not, this is not a one-man show. This is a team. And if we can just keep that spirit going, then we can just continue to be as great as we are now. So thank you, thank you everyone. Any questions? Uh, Allison, thank you for joining us and we'll be in touch and welcome. Any Anyone else? Um, I think- uh, uh, Co Coble. Coble, okay. do you have something? You're just waving goodbye? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one other quick thing, please, uh, Charlotte, be sure that you all are uh, applying for the presidential citation. You've certainly earned it. So be sure to get that information and I'll get with you to make sure you have everything that you need to make the application. Thank you, BJ. And thank you, family. And let's go and serve. We've had quite a, quite, I mean, this has been not only quite an interesting evening. We've had quite an interesting year. So thank you, everyone. We're all one and as a family. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Fred, thank you. <laughs>